Father, we are grateful again for the opportunity to worship you. And Lord, we say thank you that in fact our sins have been washed away, Lord. Our stains, our guilt, our shame. Everything, Lord, has been washed away by the blood that you, that you shed for us on that cross. Thank you, Lord, that we have and are forgiven. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, that's a little too loud. Can we put that down, please? Once again, good morning, family. Um, can you please turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 5, as we continue our chapter by chapter, verse by verse study here in the book of Matthew. And as always, um, I remind you that my prayer for us as a um, as a group that Lord that the Lord has called together to be part of this, um, to be part of His church. In this case, we put a name on the door, living upward. But at the end of the day, we are a group of Christians. Amen. And so, my prayer for you guys is always that we would continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Him. That we would be those individuals of um, clarity, conviction, consistency. That we would be those individuals just like Jesus. Of clarity, conviction, and consistency. That it would be clear where we stand, how we walk, how we talk, how we think. That, there would, that we would be men and women of conviction. And that we would be men and women that are consistent. As we continue to grow and mature, we, we let go of the, really, the, the high highs and the low lows, but that we stay consistent, on task, on target, um, rolling forward. Amen? And so that's my prayer for you and for me and for us, that we would be those kind of people, and you're going to continue to hear that over and over and over again from me. And with that said, prayfully you have your Bibles open there to the gospel according to Matthew. Let's go ahead. Let's pick up there in verse 13. Listen to what it says. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You, verse 14, Matthew chapter 5, are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, Jesus tells the disciples and the group of individuals that were there, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Your attention, please. And again, we pick up here in the Gospel according to Matthew, the book of Matthew. And I remind you of a couple of things so that um, we would be on the same page. And again, it's just a reminder because you guys know this already. You've heard this already. Um, again, just to reestablish where we're at since we took a, a week break last week. Since we took a break last week from the, um, the book of Matthew, based on the fact that we had our resurrection service, um, rest, hope, and purpose. You remember that? Rest, hope, and purpose. Three of the things that the resurrection gives us. Rest, hope, and purpose. And prayfully, you guys have been focusing on that this week. Uh, I have. Some of you have even texted me that you are. Let's continue in that. With that said, I want to remind you of a couple of things that we are as um, Holy Spirit-filled believers, which there is only one type of believer. He, she is Holy Spirit, what? Filled. True or false? If you are not Holy Spirit-filled, you are not a believer. For that is the mark, if you will, when it comes to God for the believer. That it, therein lies the guarantee. It's not that you come to church. It's not that you know about God. 
Uh, there are some people listening right now that might have heard about God, but they do not have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they are not saved. They have not been born again. That is the mark, if you will. That is the promise of this new covenant that God has with his people, that he will send us a helper. And that helpers the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit in us, the hope of glory, the Bible says to us. And so for us that are saved here today, for us that have been born again, for us that have the Holy Spirit, not because we have attained it, not because we've paid for it, but God has given it to us. God bless you. We, um, we know that we are to rightly divide the Word of God. We are to rightly divide the word, word of God. We are to what? Rightly divide the Word of God. There's the Old Testament and there's the New Testament. And the New Testament, I submit to you, does not start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It starts in the book of Acts, chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost comes and the church is, quote-unquote, born. Say amen if you're with me. And then that book of Acts, you know we went through it. It's a transitional book, getting us from that old covenant to the new covenant. And then for you and I, the Holy Spirit-filled believer, we have the books of Romans through Philemon, those 13 books that the apostle to the Gentiles has written. And therein is where we plant our flag. Oh, yes, we read the whole Bible, the whole counsel of God. You know, if you come on Wednesday nights, we're going through the book of Hosea. We've gone through the book of Genesis and Numbers and 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Absolutely. And so on. And Daniel and, and, and more. And Amos. Absolutely. The guy from Tekoa. You remember him? Some of you do. And so, um, so yeah, absolutely. But again, as we pick up Matthew here, we are reminded we stay focused on the fact that this Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but in this case, Matthew, Jesus is coming to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus is coming to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus is coming to the lost sheep of who? Which is not you and I. Now, certainly there is, some st there is a lot of doctrine that we can bring into, uh, bring into our lives. But a lot of this is for them. A lot of this is for them and not for you and I. And so again, we rightly divide the word of truth. And I know that in some circles, this is like blasphemy. But it's really not. If you keep your eyes open, if you are led by the Spirit, He's going to tell us on many occasions uh, and even very soon, hey, if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. Well, right away we know that that's not for us, is it? Absolutely not. Do you know how many times you've walked in unforgiveness and God is still, and you are still forgiven? Yeah, pr pr pretty much most of our lives, if the truth be told. So that's just one small example. So I remind you, again, we want to rightly divide the word of God. We want to, man, make sure that we understand that there's the old covenant and then there's the new covenant. I remind you there at the end of the Gospels specifically that Jesus said when he raised up the cup that he was having the communion elements uh, with his 11 boys, if you will. Because remember, there was only 11, true or false. One was dismissed. This wasn't for you, sir. What you do, do quickly and leave because this is not for you. And later on, um, Paul is going to verify that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. says He's going to tell us, hey, 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 listen. This celebration, this communion, this the Lord's Supper as we call it, if you're not a believer, don't take of this lest you bring condemnation on yourself. This is not for the world. This is not for the world. This is only for those that are mine. Jesus says through Paul. And you remember what he told them. This is the cup of the new covenant because the old covenant was passing away he jesus was the fulfillment of the old covenant there was no need for the old covenant anymore the new covenant had come and it was right there in front of them now it had not been completely fulfilled yet because he still needed to die on the cross true or false 
And listen, there would be another step even after that, which would Acts chapter 2 had to transpire, transpire the day of Pentecost, true or false, right? Give me a good true, yes? We're all on the same page, I pray. So it wasn't just dying on the cross and spilling his blood. No, 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 no. It, 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 there was more to that. I know we want to end it there. No, he needed to be buried and he needed to be what? Resurrected. And then he would need to send his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So it wasn't complete until then, but then yes. Then yes. Then now we are in fact in the new covenant and that's how we function here today. So I remind you of that because as we pick up here, some, thing is gonna, some things are going to be for us. Yes, we can draw from that and say, okay, no, 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 I'm part of that. But a lot of things are, listen, this was for the lost sheep of Israel, still functioning under the old covenant. For just because Jesus was there, it didn't mean that the new covenant had come yet. He needed to die, be buried, and rise again. That's the gospel, you know. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians chapter what? Verses what? There's the gospel. Paul says it very clearly. And this is the gospel. So it wasn't just die on the cross. No, it was die on the cross. Be buried and on the third day, resurrect. And then... He was going to send the helper. And in fact, the helper did come there in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. And so now you and I are walking in the fullness of the new covenant. No more the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of the sinless Lamb of God who died, was buried, and resurrected. No more me and you under law. I must. If you, then I. No, 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 not anymore. Now I simply what? believe by faith by grace through faith true or false absolutely so now you and i believe that's it and once we have believed we are sealed with the holy spirit of god and i am from that moment on you are from that moment on the righteousness of god in christ Despite your fumblings, despite your bumblings, despite the, your, your stumbles and your falls, despite mine, I am still and forever will be the righteousness of God in Christ. I remind you of that, lest the heavy hand of the law burden you and burden me. He's taken our shame, He's taken our guilt. And I am now free and clear, and so are you. And by the way, as I have preached this before or spoken about this before, uh, maybe like when I have been invited in other places, I will always have one or two. As a matter of fact, it happened here one time, a while back. A particular guy came. He only showed up once because apparently he didn't like this doctrine. He came to me, and he wanted to make sure that he infused the law. His words... You're giving a people a license to sin. This was in Spanish, by the way. <laughs> Newsflash. None of us have ever needed a license to sin. <laughs> have you noticed that? <laughs> I never went and got a license to sin. I did it illegally <laughs> without a license. You don't need a license to sin, man. <laughs> it's part of you. It comes from within. <laughs> Henceforth, this is why you need to be born again. This is why you need the new heart. But you see, there's a safety net for me. I know this already. So now as the Holy Spirit works in me and I know that I am the righteousness of God in Christ, now my life takes a new direction. Now my life takes a change. See, now I didn't need a license before and I certainly don't want one now. Because now my life is one of clarity, consistency, conviction. The Holy Spirit in me, the hope of glory, the minute I go off, there He is. Stirring my heart to change and to go in the right direction. Say amen if you're with me. So you see, we don't need a license to sin. But the Bible is very clear that the law is not part of us anymore. 
That, that is the Old Testament. It's gone away. We stand in freedom. We stand in clarity. We stand uh, with the opportunity for consistency and, and certainly with conviction in our hearts. So believer here today and believer listening here today, man, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Period. But here what we pick up in Matthew 5, they are not yet. Are they yet? No, they are not yet. They're looking at the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They're looking at the very one who's going to set them free, but they're not free yet. Because the totality of God's plan had not been accomplished yet. This was but one step in many steps. And I say that for communication's sake. He still needed to be betrayed. He still needed to be brutalized. He still needed to be hung on the cross. For cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He still needed to shed his blood. He still needed to die. He still needed to be buried. He still needed to rise again. And the Holy Spirit still needed to come to invade, if you will, to, to, to baptize the believer. Say amen if you're with me. So remember that, that these people, they're hearing, their hearts are being prepared for the day because the day's coming. But it's not here yet. So notice what he says to them. Verse 13. And certainly this here, we can embrace this and say, okay, no, this is for me here. Absolutely, I can put myself in this. Notice what he says to them. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Now, they weren't quite yet true or false. Absolutely, right? But they were going to be those that chose to believe because that's really what it's all about. Do I cho choose to believe? That's it. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor... How shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So I want you, I, can I have your attention please? I want us to focus on two things. Okay, two things. How many things? But you are a smart group so you're probably going to come up with more. But for our purposes here today and from this little limited, according to my wife's brain, um, two things. Number one. I want you to see and hear and understand and embrace that he is giving them purpose. He's giving them what? But it's a greater purpose than they can actually even consider. Because you see, the unregenerated man, and dare I say even a lot of Christians, man, because here's the truth of the matter. Life is just the next paycheck, the next um, promotion, Nothing wrong with that, by the way. The next, I don't know, fill in the blank. But I submit to you, and we talk about it here all the time, I remind you that there's a greater purpose to our lives. We talked about that last week. It's not just Monday and the, you know, the work week that's coming up. Yes, there's, there's an infusion of that in, in life, but it's a good thing for us to take note and to take, um, to take inventory, if you will. What has, been our la what has been our thought process this week? What has been our thought process? Just, how about just yesterday, Saturday? What, what, what have we been thinking about all day yesterday? Have we been reminded that there's a purpose to our lives? You know, we always say that here. Um, time is short. Legacy is real. What legacy are you leaving behind? Is it a biblical legacy? If it, is it a spiritual legacy? What legacy are you leaving behind? And seriousness, you know, is required in the man and the woman of God. Those of us that have embraced the, the reality that one day we will stand before God and give an account of our lives. And so these people here, um, these disciples, number one, which are not just the 12 apostles or better yet the 11 apostles, it includes a lot more people, true or false, Okay, because there was a group of people. There's a multitude there, Luke tells us. Um, but So he's addressing his disciples, which are much more than just 11. You and I are disciples. And he's letting them know. He's already, he's already sowing the seed, if you will, that prayfully will land in their heart and one day take root. He's giving them a broader perspective. He's giving them a spiritual perspective. Again, he's sowing the seed. 
letting them know, listen, there's more to your life than the next meal. There's more to your life than the next paycheck. There's more to your life than the next little show that we're all, some of us are so like, can't miss. And, and no issues with that. No finger in your face about that. Hey, it's all good, man. I, I, there's certain things that I want to watch also. Specifically sports. I'm not into any of those goofy shows or shows, if the truth be told. And thank God, because then I wouldn't, instead of being seven hours in front of the TV, I'd be what? 15. <laughs> yes? It's just me? Okay, so, so there's more to life than that. There's more to life than I got to get home to watch Mandalorian. Um, I got to get home to watch the, in my case, the Florida Panthers. Um, there's more to life than that. And he, again, right now is sowing the seed. Hey, 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 listen. I want to remind you that if you embrace this, if you, if you make this yours, which I want this to make this your, yours, I want to tell you, you're the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Notice verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You think it's about the next paycheck. You think it's about the next promotion. You think it's about the next fill in your blank. I'm saying to you that there's something much more to your life. You are a, the light of the world. A city is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 15, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. Hey, here's the culmination of it all. Here is the culmination of it all. It, it is for them, it was for them, and listen, it is for you and I. Because here's the culmination of it all. If you want to, if you want to s surmise, summarize the Christian what is the man's the Christian man, woman's all in all? Here it is. Look at verse 16. Because here it is. We can close up shop after this. Because this is it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Here it is, family. And glorify. And what? And glorify your Father in heaven. This is it right here, man. This is what it's all about. Right here. Period. Sometimes it's with our words. Sometimes it's with our actions. Listen, it's always with our thoughts. How's our thought life? Is it glorifying God? Nobody knows, but you and the, God bless you, the Lord this is what it's all about right here. Would you look up here, please? 1 Peter 4.11, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Listen to what it says. Peter, if anyone speaks, he says, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, godly speech. Say amen if you're with me. If anyone ministers, hey, you're talking to somebody, you're helping somebody, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. Have you noticed the, 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 the two, uh, what is the word here that we keep seeing? Let me give you a hint. It starts with G. God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Notice that in all things, how many things? Tell me again, that in how many things? In all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And by the way, for us believers, it's always going to be through Jesus Christ. True or false? Absolutely. So if we're a believer, then God can be glorified. Well, but it's of course it's through Jesus Christ. But the point is that we would glorify God. That in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And let's keep that up there for one second. And so notice, family, at the end of the day, it's all about your life, my life, our life, glorifying, magnifying God. 
And this is what he's letting them know. Hey, the day's coming when you're going to have the ability to do that by the power of the Spirit through Jesus Christ. And again, my, my challenge to you is this and my question to you is this. How has your week gone? Because I know that, oh, actually, we, see, we saw each other Wednesday. How have these last couple of days gone? Is our life, is our speech, are our actions, um, are our thoughts glorifying God? And, and th th there's the challenge. And, and only you know, and only God knows. And so where are we with that? And uh, Edward Abraham, where are you with that? Because this is what it's all about here. And again, I submit to you that, man, we can, we can circle and underline that verse uh, 16, and that's it. That's where it's all right there. As a believer, that is all, all, that's it right there. See, because if we get this in order, if this is our, if this is our priority, Lord, that I would magnify you, Lord, that I would glorify you individually and obviously here collectively, You've heard me pray this all the time. As the pastor of the church, my desire is that we as a group, that what happens here would do nothing but magnify him and glorify him. Anything, anything under that is dishonoring him and we want nothing to do with that. But this is what it's all about right here. See, because if I have this as the for, at the forefront of my mind always, then man, I'm going to walk correctly. I am going to walk in that righteousness that I am already, that I have already embraced, that, that, that already is me. For I am the righteousness of God in Christ, positionally. But now I work it out practically. But if this is my priority, Lord, that you would be magnified. Lord, that you would be glorified in my life, in my thoughts, in my actions, in my speech, in how I deal with people, in what they hear me say, in what they don't hear me say. It's a done deal, family. I am walking in with my purpose in life. And there's the challenge for all of us. Man, where are we with this? For the males here today, for the, for the, for the, um, the house leaders here today, how's that going? Are you leading your family in that? We have a bunch of pregnant ladies here. Not a bunch, but a couple. And... Um, and we have a bunch of fathers here. Men, are your kids, the, 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 are you, do your kids know Jesus? Are you guiding in the proper direction? Some of us have older kids. Did we guide them in the proper direction? Well, some of us have, have we've done that. Some of us have made some mistakes in that. But you know, it's never too late. It's never too late to, 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 to to speak and to, and to guide in that direction. And so that's the bottom line at the end of the day here, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, and here it is, and glorify your Father in heaven. Period. Nothing else to it. Say amen if you're with me, family. And so notice, he continues, and again I remind you, we are rightly dividing the Word of God. Or better yet, we have rightly divided the Word of God. Amen? Good, because he, remember, remember he's talking to the lost sheep of Israel who have not accepted the Messiah yet. As a matter of fact, many don't even know that he's the Messiah yet. Many will, many don't. So notice what he says to them. Verse 17, Do not think that I have come, that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. So he says it very clearly here. Did he come to destroy the law or the prophets? Absolutely not. It's not just, hey, forget that. Absolutely not. Notice. I did not come to destroy, but what? To fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means Pass from the law till all is fulfilled. A couple things that I want us to focus in on. 
Real quickly, for you that are serious Bible students, and many of you know this already, the earth, heaven and earth, will one day, in fact, pass away. We find that in Revelation 21, Revelation 22, because the Bible says that there will be a new earth and a new heaven that will come. Say amen if you're with me. Those of you that have been here for a while, you know that. We've gone through the book of Revelation. We understand that completely. So he says, until that day, which is many years from now, by the way, at least a thousand seven years from now. Some of you maybe got that or no? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I can see by the looks in your face that you didn't. And that's okay. So listen, at least... It's 1,007 years from now. Why? Because the tribulation is going to be seven years. And then we're going to have the 1,000 year uh, reign of Christ. True or false? So at the very least, if the rapture were to happen right now. Anybody hear a trumpet? <sighs> okay, so not right now. It would be at least 1,007 years. True or false? Now you know, right? Now you're reminded so, but that day is going to come when a new heaven and a new earth will pass away. But Jesus tells us here, listen, until that day, the law is going to still be alive and well. But here's the, the, you know, he says, I am the fulfillment of the law. Notice, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but what? To fulfill. So Christ came to what? Fulfill the law. If you can place your attention up there, please couple things we want to touch on, and I know you know this. Again, well top bunch here. Praise the Lord. So, Jesus fulfilled the law. How did he fulfill the law? Well, he, Jesus, met its, the law's demands, by living a perfect life. In other words, he didn't break any of the laws. And then, satisfying God's justice by dying on the cross. He who knew no sin became what? Therefore, he needed to pay the price. True or false? Notice what Galatians 3.13 says. Next, next slide. Galatians 3.13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. What was the curse of the law? Judgment. Penalty, guilt, but Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Well, how? Well, he became a curse for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became what? Sin. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He took our guilt. So in other words, he became the guilty one. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, but not just the Gentiles. What Gentiles? Those that are in what? Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the, of the, because that's the bottom line, is it not? We might receive, this is what sets us apart from everybody and everything else. Not just forgiven. It doesn't end there, but we receive his spirit. So that the blessings of Abraham or the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Listen, your attention please. Again, for those of you that are taking notes. And what is the blessing of Abraham? Listen, you should know the answer. I know you do. I'm tempted to ask, but I'm not. The blessing of Abraham is this, that he believed and it was accounted unto him for? Exactly. He believed and it was accounted unto him for? Exactly. So notice that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Believing. True or false? Amen. So you and I receive that blessing of Abraham, which is what? Righteousness. Thank you, sir. He who knew no sin became sin so that you and I can become the righteousness of God in Christ. Say amen if you're with me, family. It's a beautiful, beautiful puzzle that comes together. And so now you and I receive that 
by faith, just like Abraham, for Abraham believed, it wasn't by works, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And therefore you and I believe also. And unlike Abraham, you and I, being that we are in this portion of God's time, we're in the church age, we receive his spirit by faith to do life here on earth. Say amen if you're with me, family. And so again, this is where we're at. Christ fulfilled the law by becoming a curse for us, by, by, by living a perfect life. And then, because this is part of the law, we, we tend to forget this, not you, but others tend to forget this, that, well, he just lived a perfect life. No, 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 the law continues. The law says that if you sin, you must die. And so since he became sin for us, he needed to, give me the D word, die. And in this case, the cross. That old wooden cross, if you will. And so he fulfilled the law, not only by, by living the perfect life, but then when he became sin, by hanging on the cross. Therein lies the totality. It's not just living the perfect life. No, there's more to it. It's because he became sin, then he needed to die. And in this case, on the cross. Say amen if you're with me, family. So, notice, verse 17, do not think that I came to destroy, oh man, we don't have my clock here. Okay, um, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to, tell me, but to fulfill, tell me again. To fulfill, for those one or two that might be listening, the thousands of people here in unison just said, fulfill. Just so you would know, if there's anybody listening. <laughs> to fulfill. And I remind you, again, today I'm a little bit repetitive, huh? It's only today. I remind you that what fulfill means. Not only did he live the perfect life, but what he needed to die. Thank you. Double M. Thank you. He needed to die on the cross because he became what for us? Sin. Thank you. Don't be embarrassed. Scream it out loud, man. You know the answers. And if you're wrong, we'll just have a good laugh at you. It's all gay. Sin. So remember, that's what it means to fulfill the law. Not just the perfect life, but to die on the cross because this was the penalty for sin. And this is the penalty that many will pay later on in life, unfortunately. For they refuse to, to turn to Christ. They refuse and they will experience that second death. That spiritual death. Forever and ever to be separated from the presence of God. Forever and ever to not have the chance to fulfill their, um, their purpose there in heaven. Using the gifts that God entrusted to them. For don't think that these gifts are just for here. No, on the contrary, our, our gifts are, are super limited here, if the truth be told. The total fulfillment of it will be in that new heaven and new earth when you take your rightful place. Say amen if you're with me, family. Because right now our gifts are, are, are being used for the Lord, but they are muddled in this earth suit in this mortality, if you will. But that day, when we become who we are supposed to become, from day one, we will be able to, to serve the Lord and to serve whatever is going to be happening in the totality of our gifts based on our faithfulness today. And so this is good news. And, and those that, that are sentenced to an eternity away from God, notice everything that they lose Think about it for a second as we expand and we receive this revelation from God. Not new revelation, just revelation. It's all there. Nothing's new under the sun. Man, they're going to lose out on the gifts that they were entrusted with to use them. For there's no greater joy than to use our gifts for the Lord. Say amen if you're with me. And so think about that. They're going to lose that, that opportunity. The, 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 the voices that are supposed to be singing to God today and then, never will they get to sing a tune to God. And that's the only gift I can think of at this particular moment. You're probably thinking of a hundred more. So think about that for a second. All that's going to be lost 
then. It's going to be a sad day, man. I'm not sure if it's going to be a sad day then. It seems that we're going to be guarded from that, but I submit to you that if we focus on that today, it's a sad day for us even right now as we think of that day because we think of some of our loved ones, don't we? We think of some of the people that we know and that we love that you even wonder, man, are they walking with God? They, they talk that they walk with God or that they know God, but they're fruits, zero fruits. And then you know some of their gifts and you're like, oh my gosh, all of this is going to be thrown away, man. Yes. But let not that sadness overtake us. Let it stir our hearts to be more fervent to pray for them. Amen? And let us focus on ourselves, for the Bible is very clear, make your salvation sure. Amen? So notice, verse 14. Whoever, he says to them, therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, then that they shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Your attention, please. I remind you we're um, rightly dividing the word of God. Amen? Right? So we don't teach the law necessarily. On the contrary, we teach grace by faith. Amen? Right? This is what we embrace. Grace by faith. Remember who he's dealing with at the moment. And I submit to you that this can be summarized. This can be summarized and we can also grab from this and make it our own. What he's saying to them is very clear. Obviously speaking about the law in specific, true or false. But I submit to you that what he's saying is, listen, there's loyalty to the word of God and there's disloyalty to the word of God. I'm going to say it again. There's loyalty to the word of God and there's disloyalty to the word of God. So we, I don't want to reach too much and I don't want to come up with conjecture, but this is what he's telling them. Because he more than anybody else knows that the law is going to pass away within a couple of weeks, if the truth be told. But he's letting them know very clearly, listen, the law is still important. As a matter of fact, because of the law, I am going to be found guilty on your behalf. But the word of God must be, listen, held in its highest regard. So again, I submit to you that what he's saying to them is there's going to be loyalty to the word of God and there's going to be disloyalty to the word of God. You and I know, the book of Galatians tells us that the law, it must be adhered to. It must be mentioned because the law does what? It points to Jesus. Say amen if you're with me. And in all the subsequent Wednesdays that we've had, that we've taught, taught and talked about how to share the gospel, we always come back to the same thing because of what the scriptures say. We must always let people know they are guilty of breaking the law. True or false? Absolutely true because that is the only thing in spirit and in truth by the power of the spirits, spirit, singular, him that points to Jesus. See, because when I acknowledge and recognize my guilt, then I throw my hands up and I say, well, what can I do? And then the Bible says, no, there's nothing you can do but believe it's what he did. Say amen if you're with me, family. And so this is why the law cannot just be tossed aside. And this is what he's telling them. It's either loyalty to the word of God or disloyalty to the word of God. And certainly you can find another adjective there when it comes to loyal and disloyal. That's what I think of because my mind is always focusing in on because of who I am, loyalty and disloyalty. And one of the things that I hold in high regard is loyalty. Loyalty to Jesus and loyalty to me. And therefore I want to be loyal. There are many of you in here that have been extremely loyal to Darius and I. And that is not forgotten, I want you to know. Some of you have come into my, our lives a little bit later on and, and certainly there's loyalty there that you're showing and prayfully I'm showing loyalty to you back. But man, I don't forget some of you. 
I mean, I'm just not going to. And I'm going to mention it right now. I don't forget the, the Riveros. And I don't forget the Capo Grecos back there. I don't forget Christy Avilas. Forget Harry. Uh, <laughs> no, he's part of the action now, but listen, I don't forget that man. They have been extremely, extremely loyal to Darius and I and to my family. There was a time when I was, we were down and out, Darius and I, without a penny in our pockets, man. I'm not even going to say it. I'm going to start crying right here and right now. And, you know, one of the families, those two back there, man, they literally raised up money so that that boy back there can have a uniform for school. Who does that, man? After I had hurt them, by the way, these two, and I don't mean to point them as in these two, they have not stopped praying for us. Listen, man, I am high on loyalty. That will be forever in my heart. And I will forever be loyal to them. And I have even told my son back there, and he knows it. I have stopped him. And uh, I wish I could tell the other two also, you know, because I, I, they're, they're part of me as well. Um, I have told him, and he, he will testify to that. I have told him very clearly, look, these are the people that have been good to us. If there's ever a day that I'm not around, you show them love, you show them respect, you show them loyalty because they have been loyal to us. True or, true or false, son? Thank you, sir. So I use this word, and, and this is a very prevalent word in my life, loyalty and disloyalty. And so this is what comes out of me. <laughs> Maybe if there was another pastor here, probably can parlay this much more eloquently than this man. But at the end of the day, what he's saying is that, listen, there are going to be some that are going to be loyal to the word of God. There are going to be some that are going to be disloyal. Please be those that are loyal to the word of God. Say amen if you're with me, family. So notice Whoever, therefore, verse 19, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if these people are going to be saved or not. There's a much controversy there of whether they're going to be saved or not, but we're not going to get into that because it's really not important at this point. You make sure you're loyal to the word of God, which I look around and I know exactly that you are. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. But whoever does and teaches them, well, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So those of us that are loyal to the word of God, what does the Bible say that we're going to be called? Tell me. It says it there. Great in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know exactly how that's going to be transferred out, but I'm taking it by what exactly what I'm seeing. Because we hold God's word in high regard, even the law which is exactly what he's talking about. With that said, can you look up here for a second? So, I remind you, the law was fulfilled by Jesus through his life, his death, and his resurrection. We must remember that. And, and I remind you, it's just not that his life, oh, he lived a perfect life. No, he had to die because he became sin. He became guilty. Not of his own doing, but for us. So he needed to die. His death has to be part of the, the fulfillment. And of course, his resurrection. For if he would have stayed in the grave, then we're done. Remember, he was the first fruits. Since he rose again, we know that when we suffer that first death, when we let go of this body, Right? We also will be what? Resurrected. Say amen if you're with me. We are not going to be in the ground in a, some state of, well, sleeping, I guess. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We put it all together and we realize what this is all about. All this was a mystery at some point. It's not a mystery anymore. We have God's word and his spirit that, that allows us to see all of this clearly. The, the, the mystery has been revealed, if you will. And so the law was fulfilled by Jesus through his life, his death, and his resurrection. 
which of course, second point, ushered in the what? The new covenant. What did it usher? The new covenant. No more the blood of bulls and goats. No more you and I being under this very heavy law which none of us could fulfill on this side of eternity because we have free will, true or false. We have free will. We're not all in a box as um, the Calvinist would have you believe. And I'm sorry to mention that, but let's call it what it is, that you have no choice. You absolutely have a choice. You choose to, chose to come here this morning. Everybody has a choice. What kind of God would that be? That's not love. Love is a choice. Love demands a choice. Now I've chosen him by the power of his spirit, by him pushing me towards him. I said yes to that. Man, it's genuine. If I had no choice, how genuine is that? Zero genuine. Zero credibility to that. Absolutely not. So, which ushered in the new covenant, but again, it's not the blood of bulls and goats. It's not I'm under the law anymore. Now it's I get to choose him. And when I do, man, I am free. The new covenant, saved by grace, through faith. The Holy Spirit residing in me. Now I get the opportunity to, to walk in sanctification. Practically, on an everyday basis. And now I get this beautiful treasure, listen, that is um, laid at my feet, which is that I get to repent. I don't know if you've thought about that lately, but I don't think that there's anything better that the Lord has given us than that opportunity to repent. That initial repentance and then our everyday repentance. Can you imagine if we were still carrying that guilt? Think about that for a second. If we were still carrying that guilt every day, We'd have to be waiting for that one time a year. Man, do you know that sin, it, it makes you sick. You know that, right? This is why we died, this first death. Remember what he told Adam? Hey, dying, you're going to die. Not only did you die spiritually, but you're going to die physically. This is why cancer is, is prevalent in the world today. This is why um, COVID came. Yes, I know it was produced in a, a lab in, um, what was it, Wahoo? Wuhan. <laughs> yes, we know that it was the Wuhan virus. Let's not play games. We know exactly where it came from. But don't you think this is all because of sin? None of this was supposed to be. And so now I have this opportunity, and oh, this is what I'm leaning to, that even today, as a believer, when I am not in, in God's, like, path if you will man I'm slowly dying but when when I when I take advantage of that beautiful gift of being able to repent for if repent for if we repent he is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins so when I am when I take advantage of that beautiful gift to be able to repent even as a believer for answering wrong to my wife let's say She's constantly repenting of that, by the way. Repent, woman. Of, of the bad thoughts, of this, of that. Fill in the blank. Man, I am set free. I am walking in complete health, if you will. Say many of you with me, family. And, I, and you know we push that here like there's no tomorrow, man. Take advantage of that repentance that has been offered. When you mess up, which you're going to, Without a license, by the way, because you don't need a license to sin. You know that. When you sin without that license, and by the way, tell me where you can get that license. Um, man, use that. Repent so that times of refreshing would come and you can be set free. Say amen if you're with me, family. And so again, the law was fulfilled by Jesus through his life, his death, his resurrection, which ushered in the new covenant. And I remind you, we spoke about this last week, this resurrection, this new covenant, this ability to repent, this Holy Spirit in us, this um, love for God's word, this love for the gathering, which is all part of the new covenant. The resurrection, it brings us rest. It brings us hope. It brings us purpose. 
No more are we walking blindly. And even in those moments, which I have them here and there, by the way, because I so badly want to be relevant for the kingdom of God. I so badly in this, in this tail end of my life, whether I have 10 years left, 20 years left, listen, I'm at the end. <laughs> you, you know that, right? At 50-something years old, there's not much. There's some left, but I'm at the tail end. Like, there's less time in front of me than there was behind me. Say amen if you're with me. That's a fact. And please don't come up to me at the end of the service. You know, stop. It's a fact. And I've already embraced it. I'm good with that. And I'm rolling. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Lord, what do you want? Let's go. Let, what do you want me to do, Lord? Whatever you want, let's go, Lord. No, no hiding in my house now, just watching Fox News all day long. Uh, no, 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 no. What do you want, Lord? Uh, man, the more the better. The more the better. Give me, Lord, because I know time is short. And so now I have purpose. I have hope and I have rest. And this is what this resurrection brings. Say amen if you're with me, family. Let's close up shop. Got your Bibles there. Notice what it says. So verse 20. He tells them about loyalty to God's word. And the possibility of disloyalty and where those two end up. Verse 20, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And there's a lot of controversy of what this means and you can go ahead and try to figure it out if you want. I submit to you that he's talking about self-righteousness. Um, I submit to you and, and, and self-righteousness always holds itself in the highest regard, true or false. Right, I'm going to say that again, and the answer is true, by the way. Self-righteousness, you and I have struggled with it. The Pharisees, they had it, always held it, holds itself in the highest regard. True or false? The answer is true. So I submit to you, you can look at all your little commentators and see what they say. I submit to you that that's what it means. There's a little controversy there, because like, it's, it's a hard saying, if, you, if the truth be told. But we've got to keep it in context we got to keep it in context because he's informing them that the day's coming. Again, and, and they're, they're partly hearing it. They're not hearing it completely, but they're partly understanding it. But the day is coming that if their ears are open and if they're interested, they're going to understand the totality of it. Same and if you're with me. Okay, just that's what's happening here. The Holy Spirit is not in them. The totality of this, like for you and I, has not been written yet. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, nothing has been written yet. Only Genesis through Malachi. Say amen if you're with me. Right? And then 400 years have passed and here he is now. Jesus. Malachi to, to Matthew, 400 years have passed. God has been quote unquote silent. And so like they have nothing. So this has not been written yet. What, what we embrace. So they're like, they're hearing the seed is landing. Prayfully, the, uh, the enemy's not going to come and take it away, pluck it away. Mark chapter 4, is everybody following me? And so it's landing there and ready to take root when it's further watered. But the first step is taking place, which is what? The seed is being sown. Say amen if you're with me, family. Prayfully, you're putting this all together, you that are a well-top bunch. So the seed is landing and it's waiting. It's waiting to be further water to go whoosh, and then they're going to be like, I get it. I got it. So he's sowing the seed, if you will. And so notice, for I say to you that unless your righteousness, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Your attention, please. Again, listen, this is what he's saying. Because the only righteousness that exceeds self-righteousness is the righteousness of God. Say amen if you're with me. The only righteousness that exceeds your righteousness and my righteousness, what we think is the only true righteousness, the one given to us by 
For he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I can become the righteousness of God in Christ. I pray you're putting this all together and you're understanding the totality of it probably a little even more than me. Right now, I, I pray that some of you are getting even deeper revelation. Not new revelation, just revelation. Amen? If, you, if I ever come up here and tell you that I have new revelation that surpasses this, get out of here. Run. Run. Because there is no more than this. There just isn't. So leave, please. Do yourself a favor. Save me the heavier judgment that will come my way if I come with that stupidity. For James 3, 1 says very clearly, let not, not, let not many of you desire to become teachers, for you will be held to a higher standard. Boo. <laughs> no, not burr. I don't know what the one is for scared. So, the only righteousness that surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, which is self-righteousness, is the righteousness of God. Say amen if you're with me, family. And this is what he's saying. And we can even fill in this. Listen, the only righteousness that surpasses the righteousness of your neighbor who tells you, pero yo soy una persona muy buena, but I'm a good person. There's only one righteousness that surpasses that. It's the righteousness of God. Because there is no other righteousness. Say amen if you're with me, family. So this is what he's saying. Let's close up shop. You have heard, verse 21, that it was said... To those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Notice it says murder, not kill. Same man, if you with me, right? The Bible never says not to kill. It says not to what? Murder. Yes. Verse 22. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause... And, and I submit to you that you can circle, you can underline that word without a cause. And, and, and close by, if you can, you might come up with a better phrase, an evil heart. Right? Because if I am mad at you, my brother, without a cause, then it's just evilness in my heart. True or false? And again, you can come up with a better phrase or a better word. But this is what I wrote. This is what, I, this is what hits me, you know? Like, man, me being angry at you, um, you know, just with an evil heart, man, like I want bad from you and you haven't done anything, that's an evil heart. And this is what he's saying. And real quickly, I want to make mention to you that notice that Jesus is expanding the law, if you will. At the end of the day, it's not about these standards that have been written. It's about the heart. Say amen if you're with me. See, the, the, the Jews were functioning on these, this set of standards, but now the truth of the matter is that it's expanding and it's saying it's about your heart. That's what needs to be made clean. For you and I know we're going through the book of Hosea and you know that this is what he's telling them. Look, you're coming with your sacrifices because it's all outward. It's all outward. There's no true heart change there. And this was, was, this was the indictment on those Israelites that their hearts were far away from God. They were going through the motions but their hearts were far away from God. For many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, 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 but, but, uh, and God's going to say, depart from me. I have no idea who you are. You talked a good game. You even walked a good game for a season there. I don't know you. You think you know me, but if you did know me, you would understand that I don't know you and you would have done something about that. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. And so notice... He says to them, shall be in danger of the judgment, continuing with verse 22, and whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, in other words, of judgment. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. And again, it's about the heart because how many of us have called people fools? True or false? How many of us have called you dummy? Um, man, can, how can you be so dumb? You know? We've all done that. It's about the heart, man. Where's that coming from? So notice, therefore, verse 23, if you bring your gift to the altar and there, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, verse 24, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother 
and then come and offer your gift, your attention, please. Um, again, I'm reminding you that he's telling them, look, it's about the heart. It's not about a, a system of, of that I'm doing this outwardly. They're not understanding the totality of it yet. They're not even capable. Listen, they're not even capable yet of, of actually making the change. For only the Spirit can give, you to, can give you the power to make the change. True or false? But again, He's sowing the seed. Allowing them, sowing the seed so that they would understand it's not just about following these rules. The commandments, the law, it's much deeper than that. And when you get that, you'll understand that you're guilty. Because the law leads you to who? To Christ. You're going to understand that you're guilty. You're going to understand that you, you have fulfilled the law, if you will. You've come with your sacrifice, but your heart is still dirty. Your heart is still wicked, above, above all, uh, deceitful above all things. And you need a change of heart. And only being born again can accomplish that. Say amen if you're with me, family. So remember this. As he's placing that upon their plate, <laughs> they have zero ability to make the change. The unbeliever has zero ability to do this. Listen, man, let's call it what it is. Even for us as believers, hasn't it been a long struggle? Right? Even with the Holy Spirit, it's been a long struggle. It's like, oh my God, I failed again. Oh my, I can't believe this lesson. I'm, I've been, the Lord has been trying to teach me this for 20 years. So you know. And, and I'll leave you with this as we move on. It's not about being right. It's about getting it right. Amen? Forget about being right. You are not right. What you need to focus in on is getting it right. Not being right. Being right means nothing. It's okay to take the loss. Because it's about getting it right. So notice, let's finish. Verse 24, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Can we look up here real quickly, please? So Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So our hearts should be that. But notice the, 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 the precursor there. If it is possible. Amen? Because sometimes it's not. So then at that point, okay then. We, we, then, we, then we roll. But if it is possible. And this is what Jesus is saying here. Listen, you're coming to the altar. You're doing a sacrifice, but you got something in your heart because at the end of the day, the sacrifice means nothing because your heart's dirty. So implement this. If you can do something about it, if you can do something about it, if you can do something about it, then do so. Amen? Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Let's continue. Notice verse 25. Agree with your adversary quickly. While you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown in prison. Let go of your pride and, and resolve the situation. Say amen if you're with me. That's my interpretation there. That's, that's what hits me because I know that my pride gets in the way and then I could have resolved the situation yesterday, but I don't because my pride is alive and well and then I end up paying a higher price. Say amen if you're with me, family. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Verse 26, Surely I say to you, you by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And let's close here with this, please, if you can look up here. So notice what Ephesians 4, 26, 27 says. Based on what I just told you, notice the context there. He says, hey man, you're going to the judge. You're going to end up losing, but you're going to stick to your guns with your pride and then you're going to end up paying a price. So deal with your pride. Humble yourself. What are, you to do, what are you to do with yourself? Humble yourself so that you can fix this. And again, I just gave you my example, a quick example. Man, I'll stick to my gun sometimes with my wife. Let's call it what it is. Man, I'll stick to my guns because she's wrong. Like I honestly believe she's wrong in this case, let's say. And man, you know what? I'll stick to my guns for one day. You want me to say two days? Yeah, two days. 
never more than two days. <laughs> You're right. Two days? And that's it. The Lord's telling me, yeah, really? You want to keep going? You're paying us a huge price. Drop it already. Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Be angry and what? Do not sin. So in other words, you know what pride is, right? Pride is sin. You know that sin is pride? You know that pride is sin? Exactly. Drop it already. Be angry and do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your wrath. And notice, because why? Verse 27, apparently when we do this, we give place to the devil. Why? Um, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Well, if I don't submit to God, then I'm not resisting the devil, and guess what? He's going to be what? Right there. So there I am, not submitting to God, because I am like, no, she's wrong. And I want an apology. I know no husbands go through this, but I do sometimes. And so what am I doing? I'm not submitting to God, so therefore I'm not resisting the devil. And so there is that idiot right there in a way that we don't really know. Maybe it's our sin nature that gravitates to that. I don't know exactly how that works, but the scriptures are very clear. And there it is, the stirring continues. Say amen if you're with me, family. Praise the Lord. We'll end there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this beautiful day, your grace, your mercy, Daddy, again, your kindness that has led us to repentance. Lord, we rejoice in you today, the rest, the hope, the purpose that you give us for our lives, Father. And thank you for the gathering of the faithful, Lord. Um, we're grateful, Daddy, that we get to partake of you. We get to give of our time, Lord, that we will be rewarded for one day. Father, Lord, remind us by the power of your Spirit the lessons that you taught us today, Lord. And uh, most of all, Lord, the freedom that we have in you. Thank you, Daddy, that we are free in you. Continue to uh, guide us and direct us, Lord, even as we part ways now and uh, meet again on Wednesday. Uh, have your way in us, Lord. Let us continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, and amen.